May 27th, Daily Video Bible Reading from the Net Bible, Romans chapter 9 of the New Testament. I am telling the truth in Christ, I am not lying, for my conscience assures me in the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were a curse, cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, my fellow countrymen who are Israelites. To them belong the adoption as sons, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from them, by human descent, came the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. It is not as though the word of God had failed, for not all those who are descended from Israel are truly Israel, nor are all the children Abraham's true descendants. Rather, through Isaac will your descendants be counted. This means it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God. Rather, the children of promise are counted as descendants. For this is what the promise declared. About a year from now, I will return and Sarah will have a son. Not only that, but when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our ancestor Isaac, even before they were born or had done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose and election would stand, not by works, but by his calling, it was said to her, the older will serve the younger. Just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What shall we say then? Is there injustice with God? Absolutely not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it does not depend on human desire or exertion, but on God who shows mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may demonstrate my power in you, and that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. So then, God has mercy on whom he chooses to have mercy, and he hardens whom he chooses to harden. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who has ever resisted his will? But who indeed are you, a mere human being, to talk back to God? Does what is molded say to the molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right to make from the same lump of clay one vessel for special use and another for ordinary use? But what if God, willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience the objects of wrath prepared for destruction? And what if he is willing to make known the wealth of his glory on the objects of mercy that he has prepared beforehand for glory, even us, whom he has called not only from the Jews but also from the Gentiles? As he also says in Hosea, I will call those who are not my people, my people, and I will call her who was unloved, my beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. And Isaiah cries out on behalf of Israel, though the number of the children of Israel are as the sand of the sea, only the remnant will be saved. For the Lord will execute his sentence on the earth completely and quickly. Just as Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of armies had not left us descendants, we would have become like Sodom, and we would have resembled Gomorrah. What shall we say then, that the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness obtained it? That is a righteousness that is by faith. But Israel, even though pursuing a law of righteousness, did not attain it? Why not? because they pursued it not by faith, but, as if it were possible, by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone, just as it is written, Look, I am laying in Zion a stone that will cause people to stumble, and a rock that will make them fall. Yet the one who believes in him will not be put to shame. God, I was just uh, reading something that somebody had posted on uh, Pinterest, and it says, you are where God wants you to be at this very moment. Every experience is part of his divine plan. 
And I know the concept of the elect and predestination and we were written in your book before this world <laughs> even existed. There is absolutely no way for us as human beings to comprehend what that means. Um, that would be like us trying to figure out infinity. There's just no way for our brain to comprehend it. So obviously, obviously I'm not going to try and work out what theologians have done for hundreds and hundreds of years. But I've come to the conclusion that as much as I do know, there's two things. <laughs> One, we're incredibly arrogant. And two, you are sovereign and in control of everything. And once we get those two <laughs> concepts, we should have the rest down pretty well. Um, it's just amazing to me. Your word just reflects just how selfish and self-focused we really are. That we think that we can tell you how to run the world. Or we can tell you who to choose or not choose. Or we can tell you that how you're doing things doesn't make sense so we don't like them. Um, yeah, we, we don't get to do that. <laughs> And so, God, I just pray for anybody's heart who is still in that spot where, where that self-focus is still happening. Um, it's, I, I want to call it arrogance. I, I don't want to make anybody mad, but that's truly what it is. And I can call it arrogance because I came from that place. Um, God, you, you know so well that that's the place I came from. And uh, it's my comfort place. And so you and I work on that a lot. So I can call what I do arrogance. How's that? <sighs> you are so big and so filled with grace and so filled with mercy and so filled with love and so filled with forgiveness that we don't understand that the best we can do is put you in a box that has all the filters of what we know here on earth. And to compare <laughs> you to another human being uh, that should probably be some sort of blasphemous thing going on there. <laughs> For that, I am truly sorry because I know I've done that over and over again throughout my entire life. What I've come to understand, uh, what little, little I've come to understand about predestination and elect. You know me, God. I always put things in stories in my head so that they seem to make a little bit more sense and predestination to me is a little bit like TiVo. I, <laughs> I know. It's sort of like you've already recorded what is happening in the entire world from the first nanosecond that it was created to the very end of times. And you got to see it all happen. And now we're kind of in replay <laughs> mode. We're actually living out what you already knew was going to happen. Um, yeah, that's my version of predestination. <laughs> I know it's a little bit odd, but that's the best my human mind can wrap around that concept of uh, Jacob and Esau being chosen one for salvation, one for not in the womb. Okay, that's got to freak a lot of people out right then and there. Um, that it is not by works. He's trying to tell the Jewish people you can't do the law. One, you can't do it because you're not perfect. Two, you still can't do it because it's not by works that you are saved. It is by God's grace. Yet we want to somehow put you on the same parallel uh, podium that we've put ourselves on. Um, that at times you're equal to us. At other times you're, you're not because we think we know better. Are you joking? <laughs> So trying to wrap your head around righteousness and justification and predestination and the law and the elect. God, I know this is where big discussions start to happen inside and outside the Christian church. Um, but just like a conversation I was having with a, a friend a couple of weeks ago, I told him I would be more than happy to share God's love with him. To share God's grace, to tell him and answer whatever he had as questions. But I was not going to argue secondary theology with him for the point of arguing secondary theology. Let's get primary theology right first. Let's, let's tell you 
how you can have a relationship with God. Let me tell you what that salvation looks like. Let me tell you that in John 15, 16, it says God chose you. And how exciting does that get? And I'm watching God start to surround this person with people to help him with his walk. It couldn't be more obvious that you chose him. <laughs> but yet, sadly, what I see is somebody who wants to argue about what he sees as factual and non-factual things. He can get it to his head, but he can't get it to his heart. He wants to read the words, but not live out what they mean, which is the most important part. He actually wants to make up judgments based upon what you've done and, and haven't done God. And so it is without a shadow of a doubt that you chose him. It's just amazing watching you work in his life and who you're surrounding him with. But boy, he's picking a hard path to, <laughs> to get there. Um, and maybe you're hardening his heart. Um, just like you did Pharaoh's and, and teaching him certain lessons and teaching those of us who come into his life and, and teach him. Maybe you're teaching us certain lessons as well. Um, all I know is you have the divine plan. And if I would just let go of the control that I think I have and, and let your will run in my life, I know that I could get a lot more accomplished for your kingdom. I would be more at peace. Um, and when I, when I turn over that control to you, there's just so much joy in my day in and day out existence. Doesn't mean things go smoothly anymore. That's not what I mean. It just means that there's so much joy because I'm living my life for you, God. God, I just pray for everyone today that they won't get sidetracked with secondary tertiary theology, uh, these are things that are important to know about, important to learn about. But the most important thing is that we have a relationship with you, um, that we seek out to be these amazing chosen children of yours, that you have adopted us into your family and made us heirs to a crazy, awesome eternal life. <laughs> amazing. God, I love you so much. In your son's name I pray, amen.